G'day and welcome to the Making With Miles podcast. We are back for another episode about all things building, construction, renovations, real estate industry through the eyes of a building inspector and every now and then we dabble in some personal development goodies. This uh, format for this episode is The Shed, which is where we will be discussing actually the real estate industry and timber pest reports. And we also have another format for the show called The Journey. The Journey is where we have a discussion about a little bit of personal development stuff, which is something I enjoy talking about. Now, first things first, if anything in this episode is helpful, please uh, leave a review. That'd be much appreciated or share it to whoever whoever needs to hear it. Um, just out here to educate as many people as practical. Now, on this episode of The Shed, we will be discussing pre-purchase timber pest inspections or a timber pest inspection report for a domestic property. Now, we will be discussing what is involved in the reports, what are they looking for, what, what, what and where they inspect, how they actually inspect, and then sort of put together a bit of a summary of a conclusion of the report. We get a lot of questions um, with regards to timber pest reports. Because when it's spoken in the real estate industry, people are getting a building and pest report. They think it's a pest report in regards to possums and mice and spiders and all things that are completely irrelevant to actually what the report's about. So we're going to clear all that up and get straight into it. Now, first thing we discuss is the areas that are inspected. So on the previous episode, we were discussing all things about building reports same scenario, areas that are inspected. So we do have some restrictions in place that where we can access and where we can't. Basically, we're looking everywhere as best as practicable. On top of the roof, inside the roof, inside the house, outside the house, under the house, around the house itself. That's exactly where we're going to be looking, okay? We're not moving furniture out of the way. We're not lifting carpet. We're not digging holes to try to squeeze under the house. We're not pulling and getting our screwdriver out and pulling apart part panels and hatches and all those types of things. So go back into the uh, building inspection episode and you can get some further information on that. We're just going to go straight into this. First thing to know about a timber pest report is that it has nothing to do with possums, rats, mice, spiders, moths, any other sort of animal. All we care about are termites, borers, and wood decay or fungi or wood rot. Okay. So Basically, what we're actually looking for are signs of termite damage, actual termites themselves. We want to understand the extent of that damage and if further inspections are needed. Okay, so to break that out, if we come across um, termite damage that's in the house, under the house, for example, and there's no more termites there, they're all gone and it's just damage left, what we would more or less be pushing for after that is further investigation because the pricks can start in one little area and not touch the subfloor and then they can go up through a wall and then just destroy the whole roof space okay so it's all these hidden areas that we don't know about um, which is probably one of the most important parts of a timber pest inspection now other than termites and termite damage, we're looking for borers. Borer damage is less critical than termite damage. Usually it's just simply how it works is they actually come into the timber when it's green, the house gets built and they bore their way out, all right? And the damage left over can be sometimes structural, but most of the time it's the structural elements are still there, the integrity is still there, it's not a big deal. But it's still reported on because it is an um, important part of the process. As well as that, the uh, wood decay and fungi. So wood decay is just like the cellular breakdown of timber itself and it just breaks apart and snaps apart. And there's lots of different types of fungies there's some that are destructive some that aren't destructive now it will get all get reported on okay if there's mold present it'll get reported on if there's rot present it'll get reported on and then also the extent of how bad it is so if there's some you know timber stains a little bit of mold on a structural beam it won't be a safety issue won't be a major concern all right because it's not decayed or falling apart or going to collapse because it's a different type of mold, okay? So we do report on that, uh, so you are made aware, and it's very important that usually what, what we're going to now, which is the conducive conditions, is the reason for that wood decay is usually based on some of the issues that we're going to face in the conducive conditions. And the conducive conditions are creating an environment that makes it better and easier for fungal decay and timber rot, 
for termite infestation and all those types of things, okay? That touches on things like water leaks, ventilation, and a few other areas that we'll sort of discuss a bit further on. As well as that, it's the susceptibility of the building itself, okay? That is something that is uh, we are looking for, and we sort of collate all the information that we get from the pop property, and we put that as a sort of a brief summary of an assessment of the home, which is critical as well. And to, to finalise that, our further investigation uh, if needed, okay? So if we come across something or it's, you know, the conducive conditions or it's just the house itself and the risk associated with it is so high, that further investigation may be needed based on what we've come across. So that's basically what we're looking for when we're doing a timber pest um, inspection, okay? So we sort of usually with most building inspectors, it's, it's a combination of the building and timber pest. While we're walking around, we can do all these things simultaneously and you get two separate reports based on those two um, specific elements. Now, we're going to talk about how do we actually inspect it as well? So it's an, it's a non-invasive inspection. So we're not putting holes in walls and looking through bits and pieces like that. It's what we can see and what we can touch. Now we use sounding equipment, we use our eyeballs, and we also use moisture meters to do a basic timber pest inspection report. What a sounding equipment looks like, it's just a big, it's a stick with a ball on the end of it. It just taps the wall, okay? So it taps all the timber elements to see if um, it's got just dead sound. So what termites actually do when they chew through a skirting board or, or a timber post or something like that, the outside structure is usually looking bang on. It looks completely faultless. There's no issues at all. And the reason being is because they're most likely subterranean, so they don't like the sunlight. If the sunlight comes to them, they're, you know, they're struggling. They, they create their little mudding pile, hide themselves and get back in there. So the outside is usually looking pretty good and the inside gets absolutely destroyed. Um, when you hit that, you, there's a different sound that's made. So instead of it being a solar piece of timber, it just sounds like a bit of bark. All right. Um, so we use that sounding equipment around the house. Uh, we also use moisture meters. So we're looking for those, again, those conducive conditions. Um, high moisture readings can lead to termite infestation, wood decay, all that type of stuff. So we usually use non-destructive moisture meters. So there's no like two prongs that get poked into the wall. It's just these two pads. Okay, we work off that. Um, as well as that, some inspectors use thermal cameras. Now, thermal cameras are really good for picking up a couple of items, picking up a couple of things. So that can be consistent with um, water, so high level or on walls, just like moisture present, okay? It can also pick up live active termites inside a wall cavity. So it would actually throw a very uh, hot or a heat signature of a, a nest. Now, it doesn't really show if there's any termite damage because when the termites are gone, there's no heat in the wall. It's just the wall itself. So you can't really determine if there's been damage or not, but you'll be able to see if there's active termites there, okay? And so these are the tools that are put in place. So most of the time you want to be, most inspectors are sort of really focusing on a visual inspection. So um, because I've experienced myself, with, especially with the sounding equipment, where I've seen, I've seen physically termite damage done and I can put my finger and hold and sort of, I know it's a damaged bit of skirting and you sort of run the, the sounding uh, ball across it and you might just miss it by 20 mil and you could completely miss it. So uh, uh, to me, I believe a very strong and thorough visual inspection is best. And if you know what you're looking for and you know the conditions that uh, can relate to termite damage, well, then you can sort of make your best guess and steer yourself in the right direction to help that client out. So we've discussed about the areas that we're inspecting. We've also discussed about how it's um, uh, how we're inspecting as well and what we're looking for. So we'll just sort of discuss how the report comes together, all right? So the report itself has to reflect some specific key items, which I'm going to go through so you're aware of what you actually get at the back end. Um so overall, first things first, the signs of the signs of damage or active termites, what's caused it, and also included is the location. So we're looking for termite damage. If they've eaten the subfloor out or walls or skirting boards or roof structure, anything like that, external weatherboards. This can also include things around the outside of the house, fences, landscaping, landscaping areas such, like, such as retaining walls or even a pile of timber next to the property, okay? Um, the location of it and the extent of the damage. So the extent of the damage is if it's a safety concern. So if 
it's eaten half the floor out or a second story balcony um, and you get a big party up there, it'll just collapse. There's no structural integrity left. It's a, it's a major issue that needs to be resolved like ASAP. So we make comment on that as well. You can get termite damage that is not a structural issue. Like I've seen it many times. The termites just make their way in. They eat a piece of skirting board and a door frame and then they leave and that's it. So like once we stripped the wall back, the wall was completely fine. The structure of the wall was fine. They didn't touch any of the studs. It was just the bit of skirting and a door frame and then they did the Harold Holt. So again, it all comes down to that further investigation, which is always going to be put in a report if any sort of damages are put in place. But if you know it's a structural issue, it's just going to be get it sorted out ASAP. Now, we'll be also looking for signs of past treatments. Um, that can look like drill holes around the outside of the property, sort of every 150 mil, which is where an, like an injection zone would be put in place for a, uh, a slab. We could have a durable notice that is put inside the switchboard, which is an indication of what has been put in place at the property. So from construction, you will see... Ideally, it doesn't happen all the time, but there'll be a durable notice in there which will indicate what things were put in place to meet the uh, termite management plan of that property. Could be a physical barrier that's put underneath the top, uh, underneath the bottom plate and then goes into the brickwork and you get like a long warranty on this. That usually involves ongoing inspections of the property in case there's some sort of breach. Um, as well as that, there might be a chemical barrier. There might be a, uh, which was just done just after construction. There could be a reticulation system. So you see these little green lids around the property. So what that is, it's just a, it's like a watering system, really. You know, you just unfill a lid and then it's just fill it up with a tomidicide. And that, what that does, it goes around the perimeter of the property um, and just leaches out into the soil. Okay. So that treats that soil in that area, doesn't destroy your plants doesn't kill your animals or anything like that. The products are really good these days. Um, but this tomidicide just is a barrier in place that can't that, that termites can't get up and through subterranean termites. Um, now you won't see them in the in the daylight, but you will see any mudding or anything like that, which is what they create so create their own little tunnels to get access to um, the property itself. Okay. Now another thing that is reported on, uh, which we went into before, are conducive conditions. Conducive conditions are probably one of the most important parts because it's also really relevant for the building report as well. So this is creating a very moist environment around the home. This is going to relate to things like water leaks. Uh, dampness of the subfloor, which could you know, relate to poor drainage around the house. Um, this can relate to poor ventilation in the subfloor, which is causing that mold growth. Uh, again, moisture in the air, all those types of things. It could be like soil build up around the property. So something that's very common that a lot of people don't understand, but is building garden beds against their house, covering up all their weep holes, just sitting timber against the property that is you know, they've cut down from the bush, which is full of termites, bring the termites to the house, they make their way into the house and they just destroy that softwood um, pine frame and just go to town. So there's a lot of conducive conditions like that. And what the report reflects is just, it just makes light on it. So the client is well aware of these things are in place that are, can cause or can lead to uh, termite infestation and to action uh, things accordingly, okay? Other than that, this there'll be a summary from the inspector, which will be their opinion regarding the susceptibility of the structure itself. So based on all the things that they see, based on the massive timber yard, timber yard next to the property and it's enclosed with trees, and it's got a subfloor and it's got timber stumps and the subfloor is soaking wet and there's water everywhere. They will put a rating together that is obviously from low to extremely high uh, for the susceptibility of the actual property itself. Very good summary of what it looks like. Um, as well as that, you also might get some advice of how to proceed, how that might look, okay? There might be a treatment already there on site and it might just indicate that the treatment's done and there's still 12 monthly inspections required to meet the warranty of that treatment or that meet that termite management plan uh, that's been put in place. Or they might say that nothing's been done and we strongly recommend or it's essential that a termite pest inspector, uh, sorry, pest controller comes out and implements some sort of strategy in place. Now, some of uh, the building uh, building and timber pest inspectors may actually implement this as well. Um, you'll notice in the real estate industry, we do combined building and timber pest reports, but most of us are builders. We don't 
and, and our specialty is just on inspecting. Um, we know everything about the termites damage and all that and all those specific things, but when it comes to treatments, um, we don't do them. So we just use it's usually a handball sort of scenario. But we do have some recommendations of like what might be the best treatment for it. Um, so you might get a chemical treatment in the subfloor. There might be a reticulation system might be recommended, or there might be one already in place. It's just you got to retop it up and then you're good to go. So that is also forms part of it. So to recap on what's going on with a timber pest report, first things first, it doesn't talk about anything to do with mice, rats, spiders, none of that. All we care about are the three things, termites, borers, and wood decay or fungi or rot. Okay, they're the three elements that are mainly reported on. And then we've got some following elements as well, like the conducive conditions, extent of the damage, if there's any major structural issues or safety components associated with it, the susceptibility of the property itself, and some recommendations on how to move forward. So that's basically what a timber pest report looks like and what we actually do. I hope you enjoyed the episode and found some value in it. If you have any questions or queries, please uh, leave it in that Spotify Q&A section. Um, and we'll get into it. Other than that, have a good day. Like, subscribe, follow, all those good things, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take it easy. Let's work.